In the holy name of Jesus, amen. No one but God alone can turn water into wine. Now, normally, he does this by causing the seed to sprout, the seed to grow into a vine, the vine to draw water from the soil, and then the vine to bud and bear fruit, transforming that water into lovely grapes, which are then crushed by his vineyard owner, and then naturally ferments, ferments into wine. Make no mistake, even ordinary wine is a gift from God, his gift to you. But at that wedding in Cana, the Son of God skips the steps and goes straight from water to wine by the word of command. Now this wasn't ordinary, but it ought not surprise us either. Since the very word of God was spoken over the void and brought all creation into existence. His spirit is the breath that gives life and preserves it. Everything that we are and that we have indeed is a gift from God, a gift by his speaking, including the table wine at that wedding. But the wine really isn't the focus of the text today, but rather, <laughs> Jesus is. Primarily, John wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to testify, or to show you who Jesus is. As we heard today, that this was the first of his signs. By his signs, Jesus manifests to us his glory. Now, we've already spent 12 days here recently confessing his humanity. That's the purpose of Christmas, that he is born in the flesh. And now in this season of Epiphany, he reveals to us, he opens our eyes that's to see that he is true God in that very flesh. And so together, Christmas and Epiphany shows us how God's, well, actually Christ's, Divine and human natures work together in unity of person, working all things, actually, <laughs> for our salvation. Jesus' epiphanies, or he reveals to his disciples his glory, the glory of God, for this purpose, we heard, that they would believe in him. He epiphanies to you with the same glory of God through the Holy Scriptures and through his gifts that he has appointed, that is, holy baptism, forgiveness of sins, and his supper, for the same reason, that you would believe in him, trust in him. As with the disciples, so also with you. The purpose of his revelation of all this information about who Jesus is, is that you would believe that he is the Son of God, the Christ, and by believing, receive life in his name. I have come that they may have life, he says, and that they may have it more abundantly. And indeed, by this faith in Jesus that he gives to you, you have forgiveness. You indeed have eternal life. You have salvation. Back to the text in specific. Today he reveals to his disciples this fact, and to you. He does it at a wedding. And this is significant. What do we know about marriage from the scriptures? Well, obviously between a man and a woman, or I say obviously, <laughs> obviously in the scriptures. And it was instituted by God from the very beginning. He made man, and from man he brought forth woman. And they were joined together, and they were one flesh. And now on this day in Cana of Galilee, by attending his, this wedding, Jesus dignifies not only that wedding, but indeed all marriages, as God-pleasing and a cause for celebration. Really, what more noble guest could you have at your wedding than the word of God that created you, male and female, and has joined you together by his word of blessing? Imagine then that this couple, unnamed in the text, must have been quite delighted to have Jesus, his mother Mary, and his disciples attend. 
Jesus endor endorses this, the scripture's view of marriage, and he does it even despite all the lies that this world, the devil, and your own flesh would tell you. Elsewhere in the scriptures, maybe you've heard this story in Matthew 19. The Pharisees came to him, testing him, and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. God has joined them together. It's a gift from God, and therefore, weddings are a time for both great joy, but great joy not only for us who celebrate, but for God, too. Jesus supports this institution of marriage, and Jesus brings joy and delight to marriage as he teaches sinners to live together <laughs> in wedded bliss, or sometimes, as one of my professors called it, low-simmering hostility punctuated with moments of intense passion. Low-simmering hostility with moments of intense passion. See, the only way this works at all is that the only way there's joy in marriage at all is through forgiveness. Thereby, Jesus sweetens marriage, and he even sweetens marriage as it struggles, when crosses come to it. His presence and support with the Christian marriage transforms what the world sees actually as an unequal burden, using terms like patriarchy and matriarchy, or what was the one this week? Masculine uh, something or other. Toxicity, that's it. He transforms what the world sees as a burden and an inconvenience. He transforms marriage into a gift, which he promises to come and help and support. So that's part of what we hear today. But also, there is this matter of the wine. It isn't the main emphasis, but it's worth considering. As you may remember, in Jewish custom, a wedding feast usually lasts longer than ours. It lasts a week. All the family and friends would remain for a week of festivities. Now that's quite a party, isn't it? <laughs> and ever the sociable Jesus, along with his mother and disciples, they were there for this party. And it was essential that there be wine available throughout. Again, wine, a gift from God. As the psalmist says, God may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man. Of course, this is not wine for drunkenness, but wine for rejoicing, for the feast, for this marriage. And that's why Jesus' mother, St. Mary, is concerned. They thought, maybe with a slight tinge of superstition, that to run out of wine would be a bad omen for the marriage. The wedding party was just getting going, and now the wine has run out. What does that mean? Surely the bridegroom was getting nervous. And because Jesus loves weddings, and he wants us to celebrate them, Mary rightly expects Jesus to share in her concern that the wine has run out. But after she brings it to Jesus' attention, he says to her, maybe a bit forcefully, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What does the wine have to do with Jesus? Well, that phrase, my hour has not yet come, gives us the answer. When he speaks of his hour in John's gospel, he's referring to the hour that will come when he will go the way of the cross. The hour that will come is the hour of his death. And in that hour, we actually have the source of our greatest rejoicing. In that hour, he makes full and complete satisfaction for the wages of sin. He dies to bring about your salvation and the salvation of the whole world. And he will not drink the wine of gladness in that hour, he says, but rather the bitter cup of God's wrath and that to the dregs. He will drink vinegar, which is soured wine. And he will drink it all, even to the dregs, as I said. He will end death, God's wrath against sin forever. And only after that hour 
that hour who will, that will come, will the true and everlasting feast begin. His call will ring out by his apostles and all those whom he sends in his name. And they will go out, as he says, with an invitation to come to the wedding feast of the Lamb in his kingdom that has no end. What is this wedding feast? Well, this is the wedding that all of our marriages are meant to point to, according to St. Paul. Jesus is the true bridegroom who comes to lay down his life for you, his holy bride, the church. He sacrifices himself for you. He takes upon himself all of your sin and weakness, and wickedness even, as he's joined to you in the union of baptism. He gives you his innocence and covers all your sins. And because of this, you have all that is his. You have his holiness and his purity. And thereby he makes you his pure and spotless bride, clothed in the spotless white garments, the beautiful white garments of his righteousness. And so again, because you have been joined to Christ Jesus in what the Bible calls a one flesh union, a marriage, you too are regarded by God now as righteous and holy for his sake, his gift to you, his wedding gift to you. So again, it's quite significant that his first, his first sign in John's gospel is this wedding at Cana. Because Jesus loves weddings. Because most of all, Jesus loves you. You are his holy bride. You are the one whom he died for. And this is the joy and benefit of his epiphany revelation today. The benefit of faith in Jesus. Now, this is all looking forward to a future hope, a future promise, but of course, this language of a wedding feast is given to us also in terms of what he gives us to eat and to drink, which we call the foretaste of the wedding feast to come. Yes, he wants us to wait patiently. He wants us to remember and to rejoice in the betrothal that is already now in baptism and will be realized fully on the last day. And in this in-between time, he gives us his sacrament to remind us that we've already been joined intimately to Jesus and we already now receive from him every blessing of the whole union of marriage as he gives us his body and blood. And when he comes again, he will take us into the wedding hall. And unlike Moses, we will see him face to face. <laughs> and there, because Jesus loves a good wedding, he will give us to drink of the sweet wine of gladness that never ends. May God grant it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We stand to sing the Te Deum. <laughs>